Yes, so good evening everyone and welcome to the Central Library and to tonight's event with authors Kim In-suk and Han Kang from Korea and Karen Campbell from Scotland. Quick introductions are in order. Kim In-suk has won all three of Korea's major literary awards and has had more than 30 books published. As we'll hear, she tends to write exclusively about the experience of Korean expatriates. The long road, um, which we'll hear a little bit of later, draws on the time she spent living in Australia in the 1990s. Han Kang has also won many literary awards, the most recent in 2010 for Breath Fighting. She's very interested in the ups and downs of human existence and how it feels to be alive in the world. She's writing her sixth novel and is currently a professor in the Department of Creative Writing at the Seoul Institute of the Arts. And Karen Campbell's most recent book is a bit of a departure for her because it explores the experiences of a Somali refugee in Glasgow and his relationship with the mentor assigned to ease his settling into the city. This is Where I Am, the name of the book, is her fifth book, and her first four were powerful crime novels, ringing true because she used to be a police officer. She won the 2009 Best New Scottish Writer Award. And there are common threads that run through the work of all the writers here on the stage with me tonight separation, identity, the idea of home, and the relationship between the individual and society as great change occurs. We'll explore them now, and I'd like to start by welcoming our writers and our interpreter, Yuna Cho. In Suk, I'd like to start with you. Um, you're a member of what's, what's known um, in Korea as the 386 generation. Can you explain to us what that means? Okay. <coughs> 그 대학을 다녔고 60년대에 태어났으며 어, 그 사, 30대가 된 사람들을 일컬어요. 그래서 그 이제 숫자적으로 배합을 해서 386이라고 이야기를 하는데 잠깐 내가 끝까지 이야기를 해야 아니면 도중에 짧아져도 돼. 오케이. <웃음> 잠깐 얘기를 했어. 그그 의미는 뭐냐면 어, 우리 80년대를 먼저 이해를 하는 게 필요하거든요. 저희가 대학을 다녔던 제가 바로 그386 세대인데. 저희가 대학을 다녔던 그 80년대에는 한국이 그 독재 정치가에 의해서 굉장히 탄압을 받던 시기였어요. 그래서 그 당시에 그 대부분의 대학생들이 공부를 하는 것보다는 거리로 나와서 그 정부에 대항해서 독재에 대항해서 투쟁을 했었고 그랬던 세대가 이제 30 때가 되면서 그 한국 사회의 그 중, 어, 중추적인 역할을 하게 된 그런 세대들을 일컫게 되는 거죠. 그러니까 시대가 어떻게 변화를 해갖고 또 앞으로 어떻게 변화를 해가게 될지를 그 중심적으로 보여주는 단어였다고 생각을 합니다. This term, the 386 generation, bears a bit of explanation because it's a term very unique to Korea. The 386. The six means that you were born in the 60s, the eight means you were a student in university in the 80s, and the three refers to the fact that these people who were university students during this time of the 80s, they later became the mainstream society in their 30s. So that's where the term comes from. And I am a member of this 386 generation. I was in university in the 80s. The 1980s in Korea were a very politically difficult time because Korea was under military dictatorship and the students would spend more time demonstrating in the streets than actually studying in the lecture halls because it was so important for them to fight for democracy and freedom. And as these students became uh, aged into their 30s, they grew up to be the main uh, stakeholders of the Korean society. And so I think that this is a very interesting term in that it shows how society has changed in Korea and how it represents how society will continue to change in the future. And what are your memories of the time? And did you feel at the time that you were part of a movement or was it just you know, what you and, and your, your uh, colleagues were interested in and, and what you, you believed in? <laughs> 386세대에 많이 동감하시고 본인도 참여하셨는지 그 당시에는 아 미리 잠깐 이렇게 이제 그 
순차적으로 통역을 하다 보니까 제가 길게 얘기를 하면 여러분들께서 지루해 하실까 봐 I apologize for the interpretation yeah. if you're bored while you're waiting. It's so good. <웃음> 사실은 재밌게 해 드리고 싶은데 I really want to entertain you but it's the language barrier. 재밌게 해 드리고 싶은데 질문이 사실은 재밌는 이야기로 답변을 할수 있는 질문이 아니어서 어, 미리 these are 죄송하다. pretty serious questions. So yeah. I apologize if I'm being a downer. Um, 제 인생을 통해서 그리고 제 20대를 통해서 가장 고통스러웠던 기억은 지금도 이 얘기를 하려면 굉장히 고통스러운 느낌이 드는데 제 친구 중에 하나는 어, 자기 몸에 불 질러서 죽었어요. 그래서 음, 그 친구가 죽어가던 그 밤에 그 병원 밖을 지키고 있었던 기억이 있어요. 그러니까 물론 그 죽은 그렇게 한 이유는 그 자기 몸을 바쳐서 정부에 대항하려고 하는 뜻을 표현을 했었던 것 같아요. The most painful memory in my life is a memory from my 20s and it's very painful for me to talk about it even now. One of my friends in protest of this military dictatorship he set fire to himself, and so he died from self-immolation. And I was there at the hospital the night he died, and thinking about that even now, it's so very painful for me. 그런 상황이니까 사실은 뭐 음, 무엇을 할수 있었겠어요? 나도 뭐 내가 그 친구만큼 할 수는 없고 그 친구의 어, 발끝도 쫓아갈 수는 없, 없겠지만 어쨌든 무엇이든 해야만 한다고 생각을 했고 그것이 내 20대의 전부였지 않을까라는 생각을 해요. 그 밤이 지금도 기억이 나는데 너무 오래 걸리는 거예요. 이 친구가 죽을 건 뻔한데 너무 그, 그 과정이 오래 밤새 걸리는 거예요. 그랬을 때 내가 느꼈던 그 시대에 대한 분노, 단순히 분노가 아니라 정말 상처가 되고 너무나 아팠던 그런 기억들을 어, 처음부터 이렇게 진지하게 말씀하셨을 때 So when I think about that night when my friend was dying in the hospital, in that kind of situation, really, what is there you can do? What more can you do than that? This person has given up their life. I thought, what more can I do? But I still have to do something. And this, this thought was really the consuming thought of my 20s, and that's how I lived. And what I remember about that night is how painfully slow it was. I mean, it was clear that he could not survive. But he had to suffer for such a long time before he could actually die. And when I think about that night, it, it, it goes beyond just rage. It's still such a painful memory to me. It was really such a painful memory. So, actually, in that time, there were many situations 제가 하는 문학도 굉장히 명확했어요. 그러니까 문학을 통해서 어뭐 정부에 대항을 하고 사회를 변혁하고 사회를 개선을 하고 문학이 그런 일을 해야 된다고 믿었어요. 제 20대에는 그 믿음이 너무나 강했기 때문에 사실은 문학하는 게 어렵지 않았어요. 목표도 뚜렷했고 무엇을 써야 하는지도 뚜렷했고 어떻게 써야 하는지도 뚜렷했고 그래서 그냥 나는 잘 쓰기만 하면 됐었던 거예요. 그런데 그후 이제 어한 30년 세월이 지나고 나서는 지금은 사실은 많은 생각이 변했고 한국 사회도 굉장히 많이 변했고 인간에 대한 세계에 대한 제 생각도 굉장히 많이 변했기 때문에 오히려 지금은 어, 어떻게 써야 되지? 무엇을 써야 되지? 그런 생각들이 훨씬 더 힘들어지는 그런 상황에 좀 변화도 있습니다. So at the time it was actually quite clear for me what I had to do because it, for me, it was clear that literature had to do something to change this kind of injustice in society. So I had a very clear goal of what I was going to do. I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to write. And so my entire 20s, I spent this time pursuing this goal. And so for me, that time, it wasn't hard to be a writer because I knew so well what I wanted to achieve. But that was 30 years ago. And now, Korean society has changed, and my thoughts have changed as well. And so now, I'm thinking about what I'm going to write. It's actually less clear now than it was 30 years ago. Thank you. Kang, what does the, the term, uh, the 386 generation, mean to you? Uh, 
새벽 세대는 아니에요. 그 아래, 그 바로 아래 세대인데요. 어, 제가 대학에 들어간 것은 1989년이었어요. 그래서 1987년에 이제 어떤 어, 뭔가 이제 80년대 운동이 마무리된 다음에 이제 대학에 들어가게 됐죠. I'm not really part of that generation because uh, the kind of the the demonstration and these kind of social movements winded down around 1987, and I went to university in 1989, so I was just after that. 그렇지만 어 저는 10대 시절에 그러니까 지금 김인숙 선배가 겪었던 것을 이제 김인숙 선배처럼 현장에서 겪은 건 아니지만 10대에 이제 저는 80년대를 보냈는데 굉장히 어두운 시절이었던 것은 분명해요. 그리고 저는 광주에서 무슨 일이 일어났는지 알고 있었거든요. 그래서 그게 굉장히 저에게 어, 큰 영향을 미쳤어요. 그래서 광주에서 학살이 일어났었고 저는 또 어렸기 때문에 그것을 어떤 정부에 대한 분노로 받아들였기보다는 인간이라는 게 얼마나 잔인한 존재일 수 있는지 인간이라는 건 도대체 뭔지 그리고 나도 인간이라는 사실 그거에 대해서 오히려 좀더 근본적인 고민을 하게 됐어요. 시대에 대한 고민보다는. I wasn't at the, at the really front lines like i n s u k was because I was only a teenager but I still remember that time as well. And also, I knew what, was going, what went on in Gwangju. I knew about the Gwangju massacre, which kept a secret in Korea for a long time under the military regime, but I was aware of it. And so, of course, it was such a traumatic experience in my formative years. But because I was so very young, the way I thought about it was not so much about rage, but it was a question about how people can do such atrocious things to other people. How can man be so cruel to his fellow man? And so I, was, I became interested in the question of what, did, what is it to be human and who am I as such a human? So it was more about this kind of fundamental question rather than about the historical situation in Korea at the time. So quite soon we will, we will hear from um, a reading from The Long Road, but just a quick question in, um, about the fact that democracy came and capitalism came. And in your writing, as you've said, then you began to consider the problems that began to appear, people feeling um, alienated, feeling down, struggling um, with society as, as it then was. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that, how society changed after democracy and, and why you think that happened? <웃음> 한국의 민주화 이후에 사람들이 변한 것 중에 어, 물론 사회도 변하고 그 사람들의 사고방식도 굉장히 많이 변했을 텐데 그 중에 하나는 우리가 그 승리를 경험을 했다라는 것이 굉장히 큰것 같아요. 그러니까 처음에 386 세대라는 그 용어를 설명을 했는데 386 세대 전에 우리 윗 세대들은 그 독재 물론 그때에도 저항하는 사람들이 있었지만 그때까지는 끊임없이 싸우기만 하고 그 어, 계속해서 이렇게 그 음, 탄압받고 있었던 그런 경험들밖에 없었다면은 우리는 그 과정을 넘어서 가지고 일단 그 민주화를 이루고 대선을 이루고 우리 손으로 대통령을 뽑고 그렇게 했었던 그 경험을 갖게 된. 승리를 쟁취를 했었던 그런 경험을 가진 세대인 것이죠. 그래서 어 굉장히 그 희망차게 생각을 했, 했었고 어 단순히 이게 그어 세계가 그 민주화냐 아니냐 이런 부분이 아니라 그 동력을 가지고 굉장히 많은 것을 이룰 수 있을 거라고 생각을 했었어요. So as you said, things have changed a lot in Korean society after we achieved democratization. And how that relates to the 386 generation is that for us, it was a huge victory. I mean, the generation before us, they were also fighting the oppression, but they only felt and they never experienced this kind of victory. But we were the ones who actually managed to elect a democratic president and put him in the office. So it was such a hopeful time for us and we believed we would achieve so many great things. And so there was such positive energy for our generation.
어, 그리고 그것은 분명히 굉장히 역사적인 사건이고 역사적으로 긍정적인 의미를 가지고 있다고 생각을 하는데 근데 역시 그들도 기성세대가 되는 과정을 갖게 되고 또이 이 승리의 짜릿한 순간이 지난 후에 그것이 정착되고 정착되면서 또 다시 그 안에서 부패와 부패되는 그런 과정들을 겪게 되는 것 같아요. 그래서 어, 우리가 젊은 시절에 가졌던 그, 어, 그 투쟁의 느낌, 투쟁의 그 기쁨 그런 것들이 그 후에 또 이렇게 소멸되거나 사라지거나 혹은 다시 기성세대화 되어가는 것들을 보는 또 그런 뒷길에 또 슬, 쓸쓸함 같은 것들이 있지 않은가 그래서 결국 또 그것이 내 문학 안으로 들어오게 되는 게 아닌가라는 생각도 하게 됩니다. So that was such an historic event and so positive and such a significant event for Korean history. But as the 386 generation aged and people got used to this sweet victory, I mean, you become complacent and you become part of the old generation. Again, you become part of the old guard. These young fighters become part of the old farts, so to speak. And so you forget what it felt like to be such a fighter, to be fighting for what you believe is such an important fight. And so if you think about that, it leaves a kind of a bleak feeling sometimes. And that informs my literature today. Here, um, a short reading. Okay. Um, you should have booklets um, on your chairs. We didn't have enough for every single chair, but perhaps you don't mind sharing. It's the brown one with the Kim and Suk on the cover. And this reading will be from The Long Road. And it's, um, it's on page 14. Is that right? Yeah, page 14. And towards the bottom, there's a paragraph starting, uh, let's do it, if you can find that. 찾으시는 동안에 그이 이 소설에 대해서 개괄적으로 좀 설명을 먼저 드리면 이 소설은 이제 그 제가 방금 말씀드렸던 것 같은 그386 세대인 한 청년이 그 자기 그 한국이 변화하는 것에 대해서 환멸을 느끼고 그 호주로 어 떠났는데 호주로 떠나서 거기서 불법 체류자로 살아가게 되는 이야기를 다룬 소설입니다. This wasn't her reading yet. She was explaining a bit about the book while you were all searching for the page. This book, uh, to explain a bit about the book, it's about a, a man who used to be a young man who was part of the 386 generation, but he became disillusioned with Korean society after that, so he decides to leave the country and go to live in Australia, but he becomes an illegal immigrant there. And now I'll really <laughs> 그렇게 하자 서연아 우리 그렇게 해. 그는 서연의 눈에 자신이 비열한 도피자로 비춰질지도 모른다고 생각했다. 그러나 만일 도피라면 그것이 어째서 나쁜 것인가. 전선에 선 군병이 죽음에 이르도록 그 전선을 사수하고 있어야 한다고 말할 수 있는 자는 누구란 말인가. 그는 자신을 변명하려고 하지 않았다. 그는 다만 서연의 손을 잡은 자신의 손에 안타까운 힘을 주며 애원처럼 말을 했을 뿐이었다. 그러나 그때 그는 모르고 있었다. 그것이 죄인지 아닌지는 알수 없었으나 분명한 것은 그것이 또 하나의 헛된 희망이었다는 것을. 그가 그 땅에서 가졌던 집착과 그가 그 땅에서 가졌던 희망을 버리기 위해 탈출을 시도하면서 그 탈출을 위해 꾸리기 시작한 여정에는 또 하나의 미망이 담겨 있다는 것을. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in Sukin, one review I, I read that said that the, the book was rich in the traditional Korean themes um, of emigration and alienation. Why would these be traditional Korean themes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, 어, 그러니까 중요한 테마인 것은 분명한 것 같습니다. 왜냐하면 한국 사회 자체가 그 급격히 근대화를 이루면서 그 사회 계층들이 안정화되어 있지 않았기 때문에 이그 중간 계층 없이 이 차이가 굉장히 벌어진다든가 혹은 이그 아래 계층들이 당했던 그 탄압이라든지 그 불평 등이 굉장히 많았기 때문에 그 안에서 인간성 자체가 계속해서 소외되고 지켜.
지켜지지 못했던 부분들이 역사적으로 계속 이어졌었거든요. 그것을 사회적인 측면으로 접근을 하든 아니면 그냥 그 휴머니즘, 그러니까 인간적인 측면으로 접근을 하든 그 소외라고 하는 것이 도처에 있었기 때문에 굉장히 그 많은 작가들이 그쪽으로 접근을 할 수밖에 없었을 것이라고 생각을 하고 저도 그 부분에 늘그 관심을 가졌었던 것 같아요. 20대에는 그 사회적인 소외에 대해서 특별히 관심을 가지고 있었고 지금에 이르러서는 뭐 그러니까 인간이 인간 스스로에 의해서 자신이 자신 스스로에 의해서 관계에 의해서 소외되는 것들 그런 부분들을 또 보고 있죠. 그런데 이민 같은 경우는 사실은 이렇게 그, 어, 특별히 많이 다루어진 주제라고 저는 그렇게 생각하지는 않고요. 오히려 지금 현대에 있어서 지금 그 한국 문학이 갖고 있는 관심은 그러니까 한국 사람들이 밖으로 나가는 것보다는 지금은 그 외국인들이 한국에 들어와서 사는 비중이 굉장히 많아졌거든요. 외국인 신부들이 있고 외국인 노동자들이 들어와서 일을 하면서 아주 많은 그 어, 그리고 그들의 이세가 생겨나고 그래서 다양한 그 외국인들이 있기 때문에 오히려 한국 문학의 관심은 이 한국 사회에 존재하는 또 다른 한국인들 외국인이 아닌 외국인이면서 또 다른 한국인들 그 부분들에 오히려 더 그들이 갖게 되는 소외 그런 것들에 더 관심을 갖는 것 같습니다. You're right that alienation is an important theme in Korean literature. Because Korean society achieved modernization very, it was very sudden in Korea. And so you have such a huge gap in income, there was such a huge gap in income levels and lots of inequality. And historically, it was like that for decades. And so many authors were interested in that. They would take different kinds of approach to this kind of alienation, social or from a more humanistic kind of view. And that was, that interested me as well. And in my 20s, I was very interested in social alienation, how people were alienated by society. But these days I'm thinking about how somebody can alienate themselves there by, just by themselves. And as for your other question about immigration, I don't think it's such a very big theme in Korean literature, but what Korean writers are more interested in today is about foreigners who are living in Korea because missionaries came to Korea and laborers came to Korea and now there are second generation Koreans who came from other countries. And so writers are curious about their experience and how they feel alienated in Korean society. Thank you. Um, Kang, I want to, to come to you now and um, a, you know, a lot of talking about reviewers of, of Insuk's work, uh, with your work lots of reviewers comment on how your characters struggle um, how they, they suffer uh, to find their, their, their role and their meaning in, in society. Are you picking up on the same kind of themes as Insuk? And what is your, your approach to it, your particular approach? Uh, 영어 독자들에게 선보이는 이제 첫 번째 소설이 되겠습니다. 그 이름은 이제 채식주의자이고요. 어, 그 소설은 음, 아까 제가 말했던 어떤 인간에 대한 근본적인 질문에서 출발하는 소설이에요. 어, 잠깐 끊고 다시 얘기하겠습니다. Uh, one of my novels is going to be published in the UK next year. It's actually my third novel, but it's the first novel that's going to be published in English. It's called The Vegetarian. And it, it's, it comes from what I talked about earlier about my question about humanity, the basic question of humanity. Uh, 어, 선로에 어떤 아이가 떨어져 있다면 자신의 목숨을 던져서 그 아이를 구하려고도 하는 그런 존재라고 생각해요. 이제 아까 처음에 말했던 그 질문하고 이어지는 건데요. 인간성이라는 그런 긴 스펙트럼이 제가 어릴 때부터 가져왔던 굉장히 큰 의문이었습니다. 그런데 어, 채식주의자에서 이 여자 주인공은 그 인간성의 스펙트럼에 대해서 고민하면서 인간성의 어떤 잔인함, 폭력성을 토해내기 위해서 어, 육식으로 상징되는 그 인간의 폭력성을 토해내기 위해서 채식을 결행하고 
나아가서 자신이 아무것도 해치지 않는 존재 즉 식물이 되고 있다고 믿으면서 아무것도 먹지 않는 그런 상태에 이르게 됩니다. 이 부분은 어, 역시 낭독이 아니고요. 어, 이 부분은 이제 어, 이 책은 세 개의 장으로 이루어져 있는데 어, 마지막 장은 이제 이 식물이 되어가고 있다고 믿으면서 모든 음식을 거부하고 어, 사실은 자신을 구원하기 위한 몸짓이지만 어, 사실은 이제 죽어가고 있는 그런 아이러니에 봉착한 이 여주인공의 언니의 시선으로 그려져 있어요. 그래서 언니는 이제 여기 나오는 인물들 중에 이 여주인공의 고통에 가장 근접한 사실은 아직도 멀리 떨어져 있지만 그래도 가장 근접한 인물로서 이 동생이 살아가기를 바라는 그런 사람입니다. 그리고 스스로도 굉장히 고통받죠. This book is it's composed of three chapters, and the last chapter is written in the perspective of the older sister of the protagonist, who sympathizes very much with her younger sister and wants her to live, although her younger sister is clearly set out on dying once she begins to believe she has become a plant. And, uh, and so I'd like to read from there. And so you can see this is the irony of how this pr protagonist, she's trying to save herself, but what she's actually doing is starving herself to death. 그러나 아이의 단대 나는 작은 몸뚱이가 곁에 눕고 아직 죄지어 보지 않은 어린 얼굴이 고난 잠에 들고 나면 어김없이 밤은 다시 시작된다. 아직 어두운 새벽, 지우가 깨어나기 전까지의 서너 시간, 어떤 살아있는 것의 기척도 들리지 않는 시간, 영원처럼 길고 늪처럼 바닥이 없는 시간, 빈 욕조에 웅크려 누워 눈을 감으면 캄캄한 숲이 덮쳐온다. 검은 빛발이 영예의 몸에 창처럼 꽂히고 깡마른 맨발이 진일게 덮인다. 그 모습을 지우려고 고개를 흔들면 어째서인지 한낮의 여름 나무들이 마치 초록빛의 커다란 불꽃들처럼 그녀의 눈앞에 어른거린다. 영예가 들려준 환상 때문일까 살아오는 동안 보았던 무수한 나무들 무정한 바다처럼 세상을 뒤덮은 숲들의 물결이 그녀의 지친 몸을 휩싸며 타오른다. 도시들과 소읍들과 도로는 크고 작은 섬과 다리들처럼 그 위로 떠올라 있을 뿐그 뜨거운 물결에 밀려 어디론가 서서히 떠내려가고 있을 뿐이다. 그녀는 알수 없다. 그것들의 물결이 대체 무엇을 말하는지 그 새벽 좁다란 산길의 끝에서 그녀가 보았던 박명 속에서 일제히 푸른 불길처럼 일어서던 나무들은 또 무슨 말을 하고 있었는지 그것은 결코 따뜻한 말이 아니었다. 위안을 주며 그녀를 일으키는 말도 아니었다. 
오히려 무자비한 무서울 만큼 서늘한 생명의 날이었다. 어디를 둘러보아도 그녀는 자신의 목숨을 받아줄 나무를 찾아낼 수 없었다. 어떤 나무도 그녀를 받아들이려 하지 않았다. 마치 살아있는 거대한 짐승들처럼 완강하고 삼엄하게 온몸을 버티고 서 있을 뿐이었다. 요즘 덧붙이면 그 지금 한강 씨가 굉장히 이렇게 나긋나긋한 목소리로 책을 낭독하기는 했지만 이 작품이 굉장히 격정적인 작품이에요. 그 형부와 처제가 서로 그 섹스를 하는 장면이 나오기도 하는 아주 그 충격적인 스토리를 담고 있는 작품이거든요. <웃음> 어, 그래서 여러분들이 그좀 스토리를 알고 들으시면 훨씬 더 좋았을 거라는 생각이 들고 생각해 보면은 그 작품을 굉장히 흥미롭게 읽었는데 형부와 처, 처제가 서로 바람나서 그러는 게 아니라 그렇게 서로 그 뜨겁게 그 관계를 맺을 수밖에 없을 때는 이들의 관계에서 얼마나 서로가 서로에게 소외되어 있는지 이 처제는 그 자기 삶에서 얼마나 소외되어 있고 이 형부는 형부대로 또 언니는 언니대로. 굉장히 뜨겁게 많은 것을 이야기하는 작품이라고 여러분께 소개를 드리고 싶네요. I wish you knew more about this book when you were just hearing Kang read it because she read it in such a soft voice. But this book is actually very passionate and quite steamy. In that uh, the protagonist she has an affair with her brother-in-law, but uh, it's not. I mean, it's not a sordid affair. It's there to show you how alienated all of the characters are. The protagonist, she's alienated her sister and her brother-in-law as well. I enjoyed the book so much, and I just wished you knew more about the story when you heard Kang read in front of it. Thank you. Um, a, a, a final, another quick question to you, and I, I want to get to Karen because time's running away with us. But um, quickly, Kang, I, I read um, an article on the British Council website, highly recommended, that you said you started writing as a teenager as the only way to get rid of all the existential questions that were occurring to you at the time, and that you don't write so much to find an answer so much as to find and ask. The question. I thought that was an intriguing idea, and could you briefly tell us more about that? I think I have to say that 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 우리는 살아낼 수 있는가 버텨낼 수 있는가 이런 질문입니다. 그 다음에 쓴 히라버 시간이라는 소설에서는 우리가 이 세계를 만약 살아낼 수 있다면 그때는 우리가 인간의 존재에 어떤 면을 딛고 어, 우리가 삶을 살아낼 수 있는가 하는 그런 질문을 또 던지고 싶었습니다. 어떤 면을 딛고 어떤 인간의 인간의 존재에 어떤 일면을 어, 집중하면서 인간이라는 걸 견뎌낼 수 있는 걸까? 삶을. And my next book, which is called Greek Lessons, I asked the question of, so if we, this, if we have decided that we can, in fact, survive and exist in this world, what aspect of humanity are we going to focus on in our lives? That's the question my next book, which is called Greek Lessons. 제가 어릴 때 책을 읽는 걸 굉장히 좋아했었는데요. 어, 너무 책을 좋아해서 이제 부모님이 좀 나가서 놀라고 어, 할 정도로 책을 좋아했었는데 어, 사춘기가 돼서 어, 그냥 무작정 제가 오락으로서 읽었던 책들이 어떤 의미가 있지 않는가 하는 생각을 하게 됐었습니다. 그래서 그때 제가 가졌던 질문들 나는 누구고 산다는 건 뭐고 인간은 왜 태어나고 죽는 걸까 어디로 가는 걸까 이런 질문들 속에서 어릴 때 제가 오락 삼아서 훔쳐 읽었던 어른들의 책 속에 그런 대답이 들어있지 않을까 싶어서 
열심히 읽어봤어요. 그런데 그 속에는 대답이 없었습니다. 그들 모두가 다 저처럼 궁금해하고 다 길을 잃은 존재들이었습니다. I was a very avid reader as a child. I read books so much that my parents would tell me to go out and play. And when I was a teenager, I started wondering about the books that I had just read for pleasure as a child. I thought there, that there must be something meaningful inside these books. I was trying to find the answers to my questions of uh, who I am and why are we born and where are we all going in this world. I thought maybe reading my books would give me answers to these questions. But I found out that the writers, they didn't have the answers either. They were just asking the questions and they were as lost as I was. 그래서 저는 글을 시작할 수가 있었습니다. 만약에 그들이 다 대답을 가지고 있었다고 생각했고 제가 뭔가 대답을 써야 된다고 생각했다면 글 쓰기를 못 했을 거예요. 그런데 그들 모두가 다 저처럼 나약하고 흔들리고 질문으로 가득 찬 인간들이라는 것을 느낄 수 있었기 때문에 이상한 동병상련 같은 걸 느꼈고 그렇다면 나도 질문을 던지는 방식으로서 글을 써 보겠다고 생각하게 됐습니다. And that's how I was able to start writing because if I had thought that they had all the answers, I wouldn't have been able to be brave enough. But I realized that they were as vulnerable as I was. They had as many questions as I did. And so I decided that I could write like that as well. I could write in the kind of form of asking questions. Thank you. Thank you. We have another writer here with us on stage. It's Karen Campbell. Karen, um, we've talked a little bit about um, the idea of being separated from your home, um, about being far away from home. And this book, This Is Where I Am, a title that very much speaks of roots. Um, you examine the effects on the individual of, of great change through um, the eyes of Abdi, the asylum seeker, and then, and then refugee, whose home is Somalia. But the, this book is about how his home became Glasgow to a certain extent. And his mentor, Deborah, who I mentioned in the introduction, she saw her home afresh through encountering it through him. And as I said, this is a, a departure for you in terms of themes, well, in terms of genre, perhaps. Maybe you don't see it like that. I can see you jumping in. Um, so could you, could you give us a bit of a background of, of, of how yeah. you came to write this book? I, I don't think it's a, a departure very much at all. Um, I think all my books have been about identity. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote about the police, it was very much from, from the point of view of trying to write about facades and about... Oh. Sorry. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yep. Wait all this time, then you can't hear me. Um, yeah, I, all my books, I think, have been about identity. With, with the police books, I was wa write, wanting to write about facades, about what goes on behind closed doors, but also within people, what, what face we present to the world and actually what the reality is behind, um, which I think all of us can appreciate. We're different people in different places. Um, and police officers have got that additional barrier with the uniform that assumptions are made about who they are, about what way they vote, about how they're going to speak, what newspapers they're going to read, all of these things. So I was very interested in trying to explode some of, of those preconceptions. And with writing a book about refugees and asylum seekers, um, to me, it's, it's another aspect of that. It's very much about the fleeting assumptions we can make as we, we pass somebody in the street because of, of their appearance or because of how they, they speak or, or lack of their ability to communicate. And there's such a richness and diversity behind that, that that we kind of dismiss because the world is so fast. So um, writing about a, a refugee, you're absolutely right. It made me have to very much go, as well as into character, look at my own city, Glasgow, through the, the perspective of, of a stranger rather than... Um, again, something you take for granted. And, and it could be something as simple as, uh, you know, we're in a beautiful building like this. Um, Glasgow also has some lovely buildings, I have to say. <laughs> Kelvin Grove Museum, for example, in, in the West End, it's, it's a palace of art, it's beautiful. Um, sort of place that you would go there on a Sunday afternoon with your kids and, you know, wander about and kind of feel at home in. But if, if you're from somewhere 
that you maybe don't have museums and you see a building like that, in actual fact, it can be very daunting and threatening and you don't know if you're allowed up the stairs and you don't know if it's free to go in and, and there's a man with a, a hat and a jacket and, and you know he looks like an authority figure. So it was that kind of, as well as every writer, when they inhabit a character, they, they're definitely seeing the eye, you know, the world through, through new eyes. I had to go a stage further back and look at, at my city through um, a stranger's eyes as well, and all the little things you do day to day life that, that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. and, and that was really interesting, and I really enjoyed doing it. And a very interesting um, point that you make in the book is, is that it occurs to Abdi a couple of times that um, someone away from home, as he is, becomes sort of a truncated, almost infantilized version of themselves. And we'll hear that in your reading in a second. Um, and it's, uh, at one point, I think he says he has to choose who to be here, what sort of personality to take on. And that's a fascinating idea. Yeah, what sort of personality and also because he's not from this place, what, what he brings with him, what he tells of himself every time and every label we give to somebody. Mm -hmm. If you are a refugee or an asylum seeker, you're defined by that right away. And, and he feels almost that he has to package his story um, so that very quickly you can almost, you know, here's my car, this is all about me. And, and you know, pe people, aren't, almost, yeah, yeah. people aren't like that. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, I suppose we all do that to some extent. You know, you, you meet somebody and unless you've got a lot of time to get to know somebody, we tell stories all the time. You tell stories when you go home at night from work, don't you? You'll, you'll talk about your day to your husband and you'll, you'll curtail some bits and you'll big up other bits and you'll be that wee bit wittier in the argument you had with the girl in the office that you're not really, you know, so we, we kind of choose where we, we sort of scoop out bits of life and we top and we tail them, but Abdi and, and the refugees I spoke to when I was researching this book, they feel much more that you almost have to speak in a shorthand sometimes, one, because of communication, but two, there, there's so much weight of baggage that you've left behind and, and so little in common with, with the place you're in now that it's almost too tiring to, to try and go right mm -hmm. back to the start mm -hmm. and say, actually, this is all of who I am, mm -hmm. but he, here's just a wee bit that will help you understand me now. That's mm -hmm. kind of how people end up. And then they have to make a decision about who they will be in mm -hmm. this new place. And you write about that cultural disconnect as well, because to Deborah, to, to talk about Abdi's experiences, to, sh to share that would be an act of, um, of showing care and concern for the other person but for him it's too it's too painful possibly too much and so that kind of cultural disconnect is there is, is there as well and you explore that too yeah in the book. and also because they're it's a friendship but it's a kind of official friendship in that she has volunteered to be his mentor so it's not a natural toing and froing of, of information exchange either mm -hmm. and she's very conscious that you know, she, she's, she's doing her bit, she's doing a wee bit of charity, and, but she kind of doesn't want to get in too deep and, and she doesn't want to feel overwhelmed either. Um, and also she's worried about cultural issues and, and about prying and about, you know, she's not been given an awful lot of information other than this, this chap's a, a refugee and, and basically the onus is on him to, to tell you what, what he feels ready to tell mm -hmm. you. So she's not a social worker, she's not a professional, she's, she's a friend, but she's kind of got official strictures that she's got to work within. So all mm. of these layers make it much more difficult for them. And it's fascinating to see them establish that relationship. Um, let's have a reading. This is, we, we're seeing um, Abdi, uh, an early experience in a supermarket. And this is you seeing it through his eyes. <coughs> this actually, was, this was the catalyst to write the whole book. My husband had been volunteering at the Scottish Refugee Council and um, I think all writers are the same, that, that you have things you want to write about, but there'll always be some piece of grit, some catalyst that you think, ah, now I know how I'm going to, to write about this big feeling. And it was when my husband was, was coming home at night and telling me some of the stories that he had heard. Um, and this was a, a refugee's experience of his first night in Glasgow. Um, obviously, I didn't just steal it. I, I spoke to the person and I asked if it was OK. Um, this book isn't about him, but this incident kind of unlocked the whole issue about language and, and, and how I thought I could uh, approach it. <clears throat> this is Abdi talking. I go to the grocer's shop. I can go to any shop now in theory, but this small stretch of chip shop and licensed grocers and bookmakers, they're the shops I know. 30 minutes walk from my house, 
There's also a supermarket, a vast grey space full of tins and freezers. I went there on my first night here. It was my fault. I had turned left instead of right. Eventually, I came to its garish lights and I recognised its blue and yellow sign because it was on the list for vouchers. When I got there, I felt like I triumphed. And then I realised I didn't know the words for their food. That was the only time I thought I might lose control. The cold in my hands was intense. My daughter was slipping from my grasp and crying because she was so tired, so cold. You can't imagine the pain of a cold that makes the blood inside your fingertips go hard and die. Yeah, now I know about gloves and hats, but not then. And where was I to leave my little girl? Alone in an unknown room? So we walked in the freezing night air, my daughter weeping in my neck and me trying to shelter her inside my own coat. I could accept the sun had left us, but I struggled to understand where the moon was. At home, the moon and stars are so big, you can see by them. You can work by them through the night. Only thin glimmers here. In the shop, it was a little warmer. My arms ached. The burning inside made worse by how the outside was so cold. I put Rebecca down. Take Abel's hand, baby. Look, put your cold, cold hand in Abel's warm one. Together we trudged the aisles, overcome by coloured boxes and huge chests of ice bags. Were my vouchers for all of these things? Or just some? What were they? Was it food or drink or paper or books? Nothing I could recognise, nothing I could touch or see the shape or smell of. Was I meant to open up one of the packets to check? Several times I lifted an item, then dropped it. Impotence and hunger growing trying to keep smiling for my daughter. For so long, all my food had been given to me. I'd forgotten how to provide. At last, a man came up to us, words spattering like oil in a too hot pan. Help was one I seized on. I tried to say what I needed, but I was so tired, the only words I could remember were French. He was pointing, jabbing his finger to somewhere beyond my neck, and I became terrified he'd give up and walk away. All I could do was offer my voucher card. He nodded, fried up some more words for me, but I could take nothing in. The thought of going back to that freezing building, all the way back with no food, it made me want to weep. Then the man stopped talking, gestured me to sit on a pile of tins. I did as I was told, lifting Rebecca on my lap. He handed me a sheet of paper and a pen. I shook my head. All of my words had escaped me. I couldn't write in any language now. He waved his wrists in front of his face. He was miming spooning food. I nodded again, frantically this time, and he pointed once more to the paper. Suddenly, I realised. I held the pen. My fingers were numb, but I held it like a clamp. I drew one curved line that tapered to a point, then reversed it with another. I made the two ends intersect, flick out. I held it up to him. Fish, he goes, you are wanting fish. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. We haven't got very much time left now, but I would like to um, offer you the chance to ask any of our authors a question. We do, I think, have a roving microphone, which can, uh, will come to you. If you could just uh, raise your hand, and uh, Annie will, will rush to you with the microphone. We've got a couple of minutes. And if not, I have some more questions, so it's fine. Anyone? Someone down the front here. It is quite a departure, Karen, from your crime fiction, which I love. Um, how have your general readership reacted to the new book? I think this book has had the best response out of anything I've written. Um, and I've been really, really touched by it. And it wasn't my intention. I don't think when you, when you write, there's something you want to say, and it's good if it communicates to somebody else. But you're not setting out to change the world or change people's minds, you're, you're asking questions. And I have had so many letters and emails from people saying um, it's made me look at refugees in a different light. Or even this morning I had one from somebody whose mum had, had taken it to her book group. And um, sort of reading between the lines, you know, she, she said something like, there was quite a few ladies there who had set ideas about refugees. <laughs> Um, but they all had a, a discussion afterwards and, and a few of them felt a wee bit differently. Um, and, and that's been an amazing thing, which um, I wasn't expecting. So um, I don't know if that's the same people that have read my other books or not, but it's certainly been a, a very warm response, which has been lovely. Thank you. 